the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please, please be seated. This is a special weekend in our country and in the church. Today, many in our country will gather to give thanks to those who bravely fought and gave their lives for our freedom. On the walls and plaques of our church, you can find the names of many of our own parishioners who made our freedom possible. Of course, this is the unofficial beginning of summer, time for family barbecues, summer camps, sand on the floors, and white pants. <clears throat> In the church today, we celebrate Trinity Sunday, and it's easy to see why on this day, the preaching often falls to the deacon. What with the confusing abstract concept of the Trinity, it's best avoided by priests who want to head to the beach and left for the deacon to tackle. Hopefully my sermon won't resemble the Trinity and leave you equally stunned. <laughs> so Trinity Sunday is a feast day in the church and is equally ancient in its origins. Pope Gregory IX first established Trinity Sunday in 828 CE. In 1334, Pope John XXII established Trinity Sunday as a universal observance, and it has been celebrated on the Sunday following Pentecost each year since. In confirmation class, the Trinity is one of the first concepts we try to explain to a bewildered group of teenagers. The basic Trinity doctrine can be explained like this that God is one God, but three co-eternal and consubstantial persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But is it that simple? Not really. Scholars, theologians, and regular church folk have long debated, fought over, and even died over it. And you won't find the word Trinity in the Bible, even though you can find the words in Matthew, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until the fourth century that the doctrine began to take shape by the early church fathers. It was ultimately codified at the Council of Nicaea in what we now know as the Nicene Creed, which we will say in a few minutes. <clears throat> The Trinity is one of the most fascinating and confusing of Christian teachings. It has been described as a mystery, meaning that one can best understand it by experiencing it through prayer, worship, intuition, and the love of God. It is said that if you discuss the Trinity for longer than a few minutes, you will slip into heresy because you are probing the depths of God too deeply. When I once asked a group of deacons on Facebook how they were gonna preach about the Trinity, after a short discussion, one deacon said that we were verging on the heretical and should close the conversation immediately. So we did. So even on social media, people get flustered about the Trinity. There's a famous story about St. Augustine who was working on his book on the Trinity, and it goes like this. He was walking by the seaside one day, meditating on the difficult problem of how God could be three persons at once, and he came upon a little child. The child had dug a hole in the sand, and with a small spoon or seashell, was scooping water from the sea into the hole. Augustine watched him for a while and finally asked the child what he was doing. The child answered that he would scoop all the water from the sea and pour it into the little hole in the sand. What? Augustine said. That's impossible. Obviously the sea is too large and the hole is too small. Indeed, said the child, but I will sooner draw all the water from the sea and empty it into this hole than you will succeed in penetrating the mystery of the Holy Trinity with your limited understanding. Augustine turned away in amazement, and when he looked back, the child had disappeared. So what do preachers and teachers say about the Trinity? Richard Rohr, the Franciscan monk, wrote that the Trinitarian flow is like the rise and fall of tides on a shore. All reality can be pictured as an infinite outflowing that generates an eternal inflowing. 
C.S. Lewis wrote that the most important difference between Christianity and all other religions is that in Christianity, God is not a static thing, not even a person, but a dynamic, pulsating activity, a life, almost a kind of drama, almost, if you will not think me irreverent, a kind of dance. The medieval priest and preacher, Thomas Akempis wrote, what doth it profit thee to enter into deep discussions concerning the Holy Trinity, if thou lack humility and be thus displeasing to the Trinity? The writer Anne Lamott said this, I don't need to understand the hypostatic unity of the Trinity, I just need to turn my life over to whoever came up with redwood trees. Sometimes the simplest illustrations are the best. Legend had it that St. Patrick would pluck a shamrock from the grass and point to its one stem and three leaves, although Merrick has said that this is only a myth. An apple is sometimes used, the skin, the flesh, and the seeds. Sometimes the word Trinity has absolutely nothing to do with God. In Southern cuisine, the foundation for all good recipes is called the Holy Trinity, which is, of course, the onion, celery, and peppers. Three is a holy number. Across cultures and religions, it is the number connected with wholeness, eternity, and unity. After seven, it is the most prominent number in the Bible. All the equations that govern the physical laws of the universe are based around the number three in some way. If you are looking for the number three in the natural world, you will find it readily. The Fibonacci sequence, which includes the number three, is found in the design of a pine cone, tree branches, nautilus shells, sunflowers, and throughout nature. The sequence creates beautiful spirals and patterns that to many signify the hand of God. Okay, you might say, so how does the Trinity relate to our personal lives? In an informal survey, I asked people, which part of the Trinity do you relate to the most? Many said Jesus because he is easier to visualize. He walked the earth and understands our human needs and he seems accessible. Some said God, the Father, because he oversees us and puts everything in perspective. He's in charge of a work in progress, someone said. Some think the Holy Spirit because it moves through our life in coincidences and messages. Although one friend of mine said, I don't really get the Spirit, Holy Spirit at all. I have found personally that the answer to this question changes over a lifetime. At times I have sought the loving hand of Jesus as I prayed for a loved one. I have felt the Holy Spirit move through a friend's words or children's laughter. I have felt the presence of God on a starry summer night gazing at the heavens. Maybe the reason that the Trinity, which was imagined and codified in creed so long ago, is because for as much as it doesn't make sense, it actually does make sense. Our relationship with God is mysterious. It shifts and changes like a dance. Like Jesus explained to Nicodemus in the dark of the night, the wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. It is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Maybe it's because the Trinity is really all about love. The writer Joel Anderson wrote, Want to better understand the Trinity? Sure, study some theology, but also look at a loving family and the inner relationships within it. Look at a vibrant church like ours that is diverse yet unified. You get a better grasp of it when you are taken up into the Trinitarian life as it works out in everyday life. <clears throat> as Christians, we are surrounded by the Trinity in worship, prayers, decisions, sorrow and joy in everyday life. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit beckon to us and stand beside us offering solace, comfort, wisdom, and love. Amen.